nine, eight, seven, six. Speechy, two roll. Four, three, two, one. Q. Session, new bills, a whole new look at the Commons. The Queen's speech sets out 15 bills and the government's future. Mr. Kinnock says it's been a decade of deficit, division, and debt. In El Salvador, the rebels take over a five star hotel. The Czechs, the Catholic Church, say, We can't wait anymore. Good evening. Parliament went electronic and will never be quite the same again since this afternoon. It conducted its business to its own rules in front of millions of television viewers. The cameras were allowed in for the first time for the debate between the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition on the Queen's speech. The government's new business for the year. The Speaker, Mr Bernard Wetherill, opened the debate on the Queen's speech. And viewers finally saw Mrs Thatcher's vigorous effort, vigorous effort at the dispatch box and Mr Kinnock's equally vigorous attack on the government's policies before MPs thought they could get away still with the cameras watching. On the stroke of 2.30 this afternoon, the Speaker of the Commons, Mr Bernard Wetherill, opened proceedings in the House. The debate on the Queen's speech goes on until next week. Mr Kinnock and Mrs Thatcher were in turn. The star turns today. In a packed house and with surprisingly several of the truest and bluest of the Tory ladies on the benches to the left wearing bright red dresses, it all began with Mr. Speaker and with one of the oddities of the place. After every Queen's speech, he has to read out the rules and regulations, as it were, all about members not being bribed and about keeping the exits clear. Order. The question is that the Commissioner of Police of the Metropolis do take care that during the session of Parliament, the passages leading to the streets this house be kept free and open. Yeah. At that, the Labour member, Bob Cryer, saw his chance. He became the first televised MP as he worried not about the exits, but about the rights of entrance to the house. And I think it's important that the house consider extending these rights to the citizens and taxpayers who actually pay for this institution. The formalities of debating the Queen's speech began by tradition with a speech by a senior backbencher from the government side. Ian Gow, well aware of his slightly old-fashioned appearance in front of the newly admitted cameras, said he'd received a brochure offering him advice. You will learn if you need a new hairstyle. <laughs> and where to get it. The house, then, as you see, is often quite a jolly place. Even prime ministers can and do have a good laugh. By tradition, the Queen's speech debate provides the setting for the first set-piece clash of the session between the party leaders. Mr Kinnock promised special hostility over the health service reforms. He mocked the government's claims about running a fundamentally strong economy. Couldn't a fundamentally strong economy afford to pay for a proper high-speed rail link, uh, rail link to the Channel Tunnel, instead of looking round to see if the French railways will pay for that rail link? And surely, the government of a fundamentally strong economy would pay the war widows better pensions. Yeah. Surely, Mr. Speaker, they would urgently compensate haemophiliacs who have contracted the yeah. HIV virus. Yeah, yeah. And surely, you'd think that the government of a fundamentally strong country would at least have sufficient confidence in its own case to let the ambulance personnel go to arbitration. Yeah. Well, Mrs. Thatcher was being dragged along by events in Europe instead of leading the way. Another example of her increasing isolation. When I hear the Prime Minister feeling sorry for the rest of the world, Mr. Speaker, I at last understand why it is that she's taken to calling herself we. It, it's less lonely that way. <laughs> that had the Labour benches up on the right behind Mr. Kinnock in a state of high old glee. But then after the Speaker had called the Prime Minister, again with Labour members trying to wave her aside, Mrs. Thatcher answered Mr. Kinnock's charge that she'd been isolated in Europe. He then pointed out that there were times when Britain was isolated in her arguments. 
Yes, we were isolated in the European community when we tried to get a fair deal for Britain for the budget. And we stayed isolated. And we stayed isolated until we succeeded and got the fair deal which eluded the Labour government. By tradition in the Commons, all MPs may or may not give way during their speeches if another member asks them to, so that that member can make a point. Mrs Thatcher gave way a lot today, something of a change in her style, but when she was ready. One moment. I give way to one of the two honourable members there, and then I give way to the right honourable gentleman over there. I think, I think that one who was on his feet longer. Mr Bruce Grocott. I'm grateful to the Prime Minister. Will she now give the House her latest estimate of when she will be so satisfied with her 10 years management of the National Health Service that she will start to use it herself. Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, if there were, as the Honourable Gentleman knows, if there were an accident or disaster, all of us have to use it. In fact, there were so many interruptions that Mrs. Thatcher cut short her prepared remarks and ended her speech fairly abruptly. Against the background of a sure defence, our programme set out in the gracious speech of enlarging opportunity, enhancing the quality of life, and improving well-being is the right one for Britain of the 1990s, and I commend it to the House. As so often happens, once Mrs. Thatcher and Mr. Kinnock have finished, MPs tend to drift away, and so it was to a rather less than packed chamber that the Liberal Democrats leader, Paddy Ashdown, spoke. But he did make a strong point about the government's attitude to the Vietnamese boat people, now in Hong Kong. I've noticed that um, if you uh, are an East German, and you jump in your Trabant car, and you drive to West Germany by way of the Czech border. Yeah. You are told that you are a champion of freedom. Yeah. You receive a hundred marks. Yeah. You get in due course a house and have praise heaped on you by the Prime Minister. Yeah. But if the tyranny from, of communism you seek to get away from Spend happens to be Vietnamese, yeah. right. if you jump in a leaky boat yeah. and you sail across the most dangerous, one of the most dangerous seas in the world, and if by chance you arrive in Hong Kong, your action categorizes you as an economic refugee. When it comes to the later backbench speeches in any debate, numbers in the chamber always dwindle, even if it's a Tory attacking his own government. I have long believed that the sole use of interest rates to deal with inflation is counterproductive and inflationary in itself. And in the process, it makes our manufacturing industry less competitive and it is a disincentive to investment. On their side, Labour members have been keeping up a steady drumbeat of criticism of Mrs Thatcher and her speech this afternoon. I listen with frustration at the complacency which she still shows in the wake of 10 years of economic destruction of her manufacturing industry. I listen with anger at her utter refusal still to accept one iota of responsibility for the ills of Britain. For the most part, MPs have been on their very best behaviour today. Only Labour's Dennis Skinner trying to make his point by turning his back on the camera. The Queen's speech debate will go on till next Tuesday. A chance for those backbenchers who catch the chair's eye, as much as for the government and opposition spokesmen, to make their points. Michael Brunson, News at 10, Westminster. It was a big day for MPs and for MPs who are critics of MPs. They all did want to create a good impression for the television critics and, of course, for their own watching public. Tory MPs were attired in their finery for the big day, some more outrageously than others. But the MPs stressed that they'd put on their fancy duds for the state opening, not for the cameras in the Commons. Some people were allowed to dress up for the Commons even before it was televised. Tonight, ITN showed a group of MPs a videotape of this afternoon's proceedings when they were all in the House, including Ian Gow, the first televised MP. You're not very pretty, Ian, but I prefer you to the Prime Minister. I've got to say this. So how did Mr Gow think he'd done? You have to make no concessions whatever to the intrusion of the television cameras into the House of Commons. You just have to go on as you are. And, uh, of course, it's uh, perfectly clear that I'm not a star of television, but I knew that before the television cameras came in. Well, if you could have seen Hattersley's face when, was when Kinnock was on, he looked as if he was sucking a sour plum. Did you see him? And undoubtedly, everybody, the women wear hats, the men were dressed up, they'd ironed their suits, they'd brushed the dandruff off their collar just in case the cameras caught them. And all the Labour people were wearing red ties. 
but otherwise I think they look fairly normal, as normal as they're ever likely to look. I think as well, Mrs. Thatcher's hairstyle is, seems to me to be done in the style of soft focus straight off. You know, it's, it's already been set in soft focus right from the beginning, and I suspect that's a change. Mm -hmm. They have a suspicion that our two bald, uh, bald heads were powdered.